Hello team, welcome to another ATP Geopolitics and Greg Terry Experience co-stream. It's been a long time since I've spoken with uh, my good friend Greg, who is over there obviously in Ukraine at the moment. He'll give you an update on where we're at. Uh, we'll possibly do a little bit of a map update during this. There's not a huge amount to add to the mapping update, which is good news for the Ukrainians, mm -hmm. but it's all very dynamic and I'm sure Greg will have his... Uh, his um, view on what is going on there as well so uh greg uh, welcome welcome um what are you up to where are you at what have you been doing i've uh, been on the front lines for 13 days i am now back in my apartment uh safe and sound well safe Good. and sound uh yeah. yeah safer and sounder yeah although i have returned to power outages so mm. i need to i need to put a um a disclaimer here at any moment, I could lose power, and if I do, you are the Greg Terry experience again. Okay, <laughs> yeah, I'm, but... I'm a I'm a poor I'm a poor second. Uh, <laughs> this is this is interesting though because we're talking about this just before we came on. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I was uh, talking about this in one of my videos the other day that Ukraine was attacked very explicitly last winter, not this winter that's just gone, but the one before by the Russians who were trying to take out. Ukrainian energy infrastructure, but they didn't do, they did an okay job, I guess, of trying to take it out, but actually didn't have all that much effect. And a year later, Ukraine has far better air defenses, like far better networks and coverage. But Russia has, and Russia has attacked the energy infrastructure less, but they've had almost more effect. So it looks like some of their missiles have been particularly effective in 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 getting through air defenses or using ballistic missiles that they weren't using before like, what, what are your thoughts on that um so here we go they are um so this goes back to you know it was a three weeks or so ago that you were one of the first guys to confirm that two patriots were taken out of commission yeah um with, with yeah. the structure of the vehicles and all that jazz um so that's that has an effect. Additionally, um, the amount of Shahids that are flying. So for example, last night, um, I was ex last night, no, two nights ago, I was on with Andrew Mercado and I was explaining everything to everybody because we were under live air alarms in the Northern and Eastern regions. And I had him bring up the, the, the graphic showing the live air alarms and they were just kind of sitting there for for hours and people you know i said let me explain to you what is happening right now right now Sh shahids are flying around and they're mapping routes they're mapping air defenses not all the shahids have payloads on them some of them have these three-dimensional high six camera systems and they're trying to route out routes so for sure um russia's having some some, some success in that we also were aware that the strike on the Dnipro. Uh, power plant, the reason that was effective as it was, was due to, and when I mean effective, I was driving right on the ex on the two explosions. I saw it with my own eyes. It was one more missile, in my opinion, from a disaster, serious of um, <laughs> ecological disaster we've never seen before. Um, there was a collaborator there who had actually marked the targets. So we have collaboration going on that's seem to be a more so when you when you combine collaboration with further mapping and uh hypersonic missiles they are going to be a little bit more targeted now the other thing is um Kharkiv guys is really uh the, the intensity on Kharkiv is massive and you know, I should, I can't really, but I mean, I guess I could now, but there's a massive power plant there. It's the 10th or 11th largest, largest, tallest, rather, smokestack in the world. Go look it up, type in tallest smokestacks, and you will see Kharkiv. It's either 10 or 11, but it's a massive power plant. And um, Kharkiv, that region has a lot of power uh, facilities, and they are being damaged Mm. fairly regularly yeah. chpp5 the correct. heat and power plant was, was taken out and they reckon that's going to take a couple of years to fix that is where the tall smokestack is yeah um additionally over the last 24 48 hours the increase of glide bombs being used on Kharkiv. i reported and, that this morning yeah 
Yeah. So they are hitting these places and we're now in the system having a deficit of energy when you look at the entire yeah. entire power grid. So and it, and it's slightly worse as well because that glide bomb that was used is a new type. So it's a 90 kilometer range one mm -hmm. that's not been seen before which which is adds another challenge because Kharkiv is so close to the border that it can be hit oh. by pretty much pretty much anything right but they can they can put it they can put it in the air over belgorod very relatively safe and launch it no problem yeah and which is why well, belgorod does get so yeah. much activity around there like mm -hmm. obviously so but but if you if you're then saying well instead of releasing these from 70 kilometers or 50 kilometers back from from the front line or from Kharkiv, you, you can do it from 90 kilometers and that's mm -hmm. adding it, it's even more difficult to shoot these planes down and you just basically need patriots everywhere you need patriots by Kharkiv, you need them in the northern borders to stop them getting hammered by the the glide bombs and then you need them on the front lines and the, by the cities and in the west by the military industrial complex they need like 60 patriot batteries yes but it's not going to happen no um let's just be honest but they do need them um so that's that's kind of the energy grid talk there it, there is there is um we are back to how we were a year ago we've not had energy problems for a year okay um what down unexpected blackouts um but we are now back to those and it, it is a challenge. I do see some questions in here. I'm, before we change gears, I got to make sure yeah. I save this. Um, I want to say hello to Dr. Thunderstorm. I'm saying hello to everybody, okay, on both channels. Dr. Thunderstorm's huge supporter and um, really good, even with Rick. It's just so hello to uh, Dr. Thunderstorm. Also, I saw a question in there um, for me personally early in my chat. How's Pete? Uh, Pete is alive. Pete is well. Pete is uh, in, in hell. Uh, literally where he's at and working to save guys' lives. And it's very, very stressful, but he is encouraged. Uh, he probably will watch this later. And yeah, he'll see all of your high peaks. So that's good. Also, the third question, how is Kirill? Kirill's birthday party has happened. And you guys will see Kirill. Very so, soon. just uh, for those who don't know, Kirill is a child who lives in a village in the Kherson Oblast mm -hmm. that you have helped to support um, with his homeschooling or with 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 clothing well, or whatever. We adopted uh, we everything. adopted basically the entire village, and um, I was wondering actually because uh, I don't want this to be a difficult question particularly, but do you worry that? And maybe you've you've thought about this, and you you're almost were going to answer this. But do you worry that by giving Kirill extra attention, that other children might get jealous? No, no, no. We that? take care of all of them. We take care yeah. of all of them. So uh, that was a farming village that had three hundred people in it. There's only forty left. Yeah, that's yeah. it. Three hundred to forty, and it's completely destroyed. So yeah, we we adopted the whole village. Yeah, that's brilliant. And uh, and I've been, I've been there and I've been around there, and it would say mm -hmm. it's a fascinating place. Like driving in there, uh, these all these uh, posts, little sort of metal rods that are sticking out of some of like 50% of the area because 58% of the area has been demined so they can farm it. And then 50% of the area they haven't. And they've got these rods with white tape on the white tags on at the top that, that indicate a possible mine. And there's loads of them, right? You don't want to be going for a brisk. Well, let me tell there. you how real this is. So you guys will see this on a video. If you haven't subscribed to my channel, make sure you do because you'll get the notification on this. But you're going to see um, me at Kirill's birthday party, and I'm talking with his dad and another farmer that works with him. They farm 300 hectares. That's their farm outside wow. there and how it's all divided up. And on the very day we had the birthday party, his father um, was close to being killed because as he was on his tractor, working on a field that already had been demined, um, he come up upon a whole stash of RPG um, supplies that had been overlooked and he stopped the tractor just in time. Wow. Uh, yes. And he, he has got a fine selection of munitions. Oh, they're everywhere. In his, in his mm -hmm. back backyard basically yes. and it, it, it's quite incredible i'm going to find some of those uh pictures i have actually to, fantastic uh, to communicate that but yeah so uh um, so yeah so that that's all good and you guys will see it um yeah so 
Good and deal. and uh, what uh, what other news do you have in terms of? Uh, so you were down recently. Last time I spoke to you, you were near Orikiv. Yeah, I was um, in Orikiv. Yeah, yeah. So which is, uh, maybe you can pop the map, Johnny. I will. Some I'll people pop may the map not up. know where that's at. Yes, I'll pop the map up rather than mm -hmm. uh, get the other thing. So there we have uh, the map of the front line. Orikiv mm -hmm. is just uh, behind the Robotina. Uh, sector, this larger town that has been hammered over time mm -hmm. for quite a long time. It's been hammered because, as you can guess, it is very much in the firing range. There, I mean, that's about fifteen kilometers. That we were we were under there. constant we were under constant shelling the whole time we were there. Um, uh, missile went over, jets went over. I mean, it's 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 nowhere. So if you look at the, forget Robotny, look to the left there, you're only about eight kilometers into Orika from the Russian line. Yes, absolutely. And yeah. uh, they're, they're just leveling it. So we are supporting the Robotny guys there. Um, and we were meeting with the commanders. We were dropping aid. You guys will be seeing all of that. Some of those aid drops I have to show after because we're so close to the front and the guys we're working with, it's, it's so dangerous. Um, but You'll you'll see that and you'll hear that you'll experience that, um, and we were able to help them immensely. Um, maybe this is the time, Johnny, that we can move. Um, just leave the map right there. Yeah. So um, basically, there's one road that gets down into the Robotny area. There's a couple of little trails now that would try to work their way through the fields, um, but it's been very muddy. So. Uh, the guys that are fighting in Robotny are are doing an amazing job, but many are getting wounded, and it's next to impossible to get them out due to the absence of armored evacuation vehicles. So for those of you that are on my channel right now or those of you that are on Johnny's channel, you do know that this is something we're working on uh, intently Um we had set $200,000 as a project total about 17 days ago um, to raise, to purchase three uh, Land Rover armored vehicle snatches um, for the front line out of the UK, get them in, which all the paperwork, everything's rolling, guys, no problem, um, to do that. And then we will hand deliver them to the frontline positions. We will deliver to Pete. We will deliver to our assault, uh, to 3rd Assault Brigade, 2nd Rifle Battalion, our adopted group. Um, but when I got down to Robotny and I was meeting with the medics and I was in their stabilization point and we were on, they, they, they are unable to even get the wounded to them because the only ambulance they have are two little ambulances that were donated by France and Poland, and they are non-armored and they are white. And you say, well, why haven't they repainted them? Because I'm going to give you some insight and I don't, I don't care. I'm just going to tell you the truth because their commander's an idiot. And he has said, you cannot repaint it because you've got better chance of staying alive if the Russians see that it's a white ambulance, which is absolutely ludicrous. OK, it's stupid. The, the ambulances should be camouflaged. They should be painted that way because uh, the Russians attacking, it doesn't matter to them. They'll, they'll strike any vehicle that's coming, uh, civilian or non-civilian. It doesn't matter. So um, we at that moment, I made an executive decision. Uh, to add a fourth armored vehicle. So as of right now, we have raised in 17 days, $196,500. Yeah. That it's is insanely impressive. Yeah. And um, I next so week. That's, will be, so that's three and a half thousand away from achieving from the, the three original three armored uh, snatches. Correct. And that's not just the armored vehicles guys that is getting them into the country that is all the documentation all the paperwork um all the exports all the vats uh the addition of uh, uh drone jammers the latest and greatest the night vision the run flat tires the equipped with the winches on the front and the back um i mean fully set up delivered hand delivered in a convoy by Jania, myself and we'll get a couple other drivers and fill the tank and hand them the keys. That's the whole project. It's not just buying the vehicle and then we go, hey, how are we going to get it into the country? No, turnkey. So I do not know exactly what the number will go to now, but I'm thinking it'll go to around 260. 
And um, we're going to get the fourth because we have heroes dying on the front line because the medics cannot get them out of even the first stabilization point off the zero line, maybe 200 meters behind it, where they run in and they grab them and they throw them in the truck real fast and they get them out. Um, they're getting killed. So this is um, this is so important. And mm. um, we're going to smash this very quickly. And all of these things add up. So if you can get your your wounded out successfully, those wounded don't turn into dead. So that's obviously a bonus in a human in the, in the human sense, but also in terms of then then they have a chance of being uh, of recovering and then getting back to the battlefield or not getting back to the battlefield, but but being part of society and adding to society and becoming uh, and working some some way. So you know you don't want to lose people for all sorts of reasons, other than obviously you don't want to lose human beings and their families and, and loved ones, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So you know it it is really important and, and also that you have the uh, knock on benefit that that. If people know that Ukraine is trying their hardest and is able to medivac and look after their soldiers and then get them rehabilitated, then they're more likely to sign up to in it as well, the volunteer or mm -hmm. not be as unhappy with mobilization. So it's about putting everything together to, to, you know, this is why Greg's talked before in January about, you know, making sure pay it goes through, making sure compensation, mm -hmm. making sure accommodation is, is therefore, you know, different contexts of of either troops as they're fighting or you know in terms of when they're rehabilitating all, all sorts of different aspects to doing war and looking after your soldiers so that it's not um unattractive to join the army that you know that you'll be looked after because if you look at some of the public opinion about about <laughs> joining the army and whatnot then then there are challenges and the russians have this we know the russians don't look after them and i showed a video this morning of a, a unit said that they've gone from 230 down to 38 so they have there's only 38 left alive of this one particular <clears throat> russian unit of 230 and the 38 that are left alive are saying we can't get a paperwork to show we're even volunteers we're not we're getting paid 40,000 rubles instead of 110,000 rubles and all all these problems that then their families would be telling other families and that will that that will just make it more difficult for for the russians okay though that's the russians we don't really care how in fact we want it to be difficult and bad for them but we don't want that to be replicated on the ukrainian side anyway sorry that's my long run but listen we tell the truth here it is replicated on the ukrainian yeah yeah yeah, side. yeah and that's the challenge and, okay and it is and and, it, and, the, and the reason why, of course, is because you've got a country at war that mm -hmm. is bleeding money out of every pore of its of its society mm -hmm. because that's what happens during war. And you're trying to like rob Peter to pay Paul. You're trying to staunch economic blood over here, and it's bleeding over there. And and things like this happen. And but it's really important that you prioritize and get get certain things, you know, sorted. Uh, more than you get other things sorted, I guess. And we, it's yeah, and we have, you know, just uh, challenging political situations, not only in the United States and throughout Europe and um, Russia meddling in everything as they do so well, but here, even the pressure being felt into the third year of war, um, where even internally in the Rada here, that, you know, guys are getting frustrated and, and you know, you, you see it. So I want to call it frustration uh, of what to do next, how to do next. Um, I did pin the link into um, my chat. Um, and then I know Johnny's got it uh, pinned as well. So, yeah. Yeah. And I'll, I'll put it in the live chat as well. Um, but yes. So there was a question in there. If we go for the fourth vehicle, which we are, yeah. and we deliver, it we deliver it yeah. camoed. Well, we're just going to put right. it at 260. We're going to make it. If it needs yeah. to be adjusted, you guys see we're doing what we, we do. But it's right. It's approximately right. Um, so <laughs> somebody said, well, uh, are, are you going to have a guarantee that their commander will not paint it white? Oh, <laughs> uh, absolutely. Period. So, no, it will stay the camo that we deliver it. Absolutely. I, pr I promise you. Um, I've just put the link into your PayPal. I put a, another payment into that last night, actually. Yeah. Uh, so I hope okay, you got that. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank um, you. Uh, mm -hmm. I was going to just uh, present to everyone uh, the photos that I took when I was down in the village that Kirill was in. So let's see if this is going to work. Um, here we go. 
share. So can can you all see that? I can't see if you see it because it's changed my screen. Let's mm -hmm. let's move that over there. Yes, you can see that. Okay, brilliant. So this is when we were down visiting Kirill and Pierre, who was uh, with us on the trip, said, look, I really want to personally help him to do his schooling. So Pierre went out and bought him out of his own money a, um, a tablet and, and oh. gave it to him. So that was, Yep. On the Kirill video that is forthcoming, you will see him doing his schoolwork on that tablet. Oh, that's brilliant! Oh, let, mm -hmm. uh, hopefully Pierre's not watching this, then I'll, I'll let him know. That'd be that'd be lush. Uh, so that's a battle bus, uh, and Greg, you know, doing his thing with his uh, camera in hand, of course. Uh, here are some of the children. Some of the children left in in that village, um, and this is just an example of the sort of thing that that happens. So actually, this is interesting. The EU have a funding thing where they're replacing windows, um, and I think they're coming through. Belgium or somewhere I can't remember now mm -hmm. um and anyway it was interesting to see all the windows being taken out and replaced with new windows uh, which is fantastic uh this we're now going to get on to the sorts of things that Kirill's dad mm -hmm. would pick up from his lands and this is a beware is that a beware mine no that no uh, that's actually a, a, a let me say this first then I'll translate that yeah. for you um uh Linda South uh, um Linda S from Australia just donated um, 500 USD. We're now only 3,000 from the 200K. So thank Ooh. you, Linda. Um, so um, wow. here, that actually is from the time of Russian occupation. So Kirill lived under occupation and they had that village and one of the houses that they took or stole, they turned that into the commander's headquarters. And that every group of the soldiers had a 30 meter by 80 meter um, area that they were responsible for controlling when they were taking control of that village. And that says that this is this section, uh, this quarter, and it's it's under the control of Capitan Sokolov. That's what it says. Right. And right. every 30 or 80 meters, there would be another one of those signs so that whichever captain or commander was controlling that zone. That's how they take these places over. Right. Interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, this is, oh, sorry, that's a little bit blurred. Uh, that's that's a little bit better. So this is, you know, parts of rockets are a smirch rockets are all sorts. This is just in his back backyard. You can see behind mm -hmm. some that green thing is is some kind of uh, rocket casing. Um, just it just incredible that he'll be, you know, and that that's a mining one. That's beware mines. Um, but uh, that's a Ukrainian sign, actually. That one, I, I believe. Yeah, that um, that is. Uh, be careful because there are mines here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's just just incredible that sort, sort of thing, things that he would find on his land, uh, just like, yeah, going to do a bit of farming. Uh, so he's got this kind of yard that's basically a scrap heap full of just insane amounts of, of random military equipment. That looks like the the uh, the thing from Star Wars where he's practicing on a Millennium Falcon with his lightsaber fighting. But anyway, that's a reference to Star Wars there for anyone who's interested. Um, yeah, just again, a couple of rockets there. Just and just, yeah, that is the, that is the guy who almost lost his life when we were with Kirill the same day. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it puts a face uh, to it. Yeah, and that mm -hmm. that's a door door from a, uh, a a vehicle. Just yeah, quite incredible. So just plenty of this imagery of just different stuff that he would pick up, up off his land. Just uh, yeah, pretty pretty nut stuff. Um, and then of course, I don't know if it's in this set here of sorry these are all random pictures that i was taking no it's back i think um i'm gonna go and find that but there was sitting on top of that s300 missile that uh that was um that was just just across the road from his uh his house so i'll just find that but it, yeah anyway that's a little insight into life in a uh, previously occupied um previously occupied town so or village Incredible. Okay, hold on. The real Dave Seaman, ten dollars added to the the PayPal. Javier Alvarez, fifty dollar donation via Bethel. We're now uh, two forty away. Amazing. Two hundred thousand. That uh, is amazing. No, no, yeah. No, we're uh, three thousand. Uh, yeah, under three. Le less under three thousand. Yeah, yeah, by yeah. mine. Yeah, good math. I'm so math. tired from getting home, man. Uh, I don't even know. Jane and I were going so hard so, so hard. uh yeah i mean it's, it's tough for you 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 non-stop aren't you um just uh 
I just want to show you this. This were, this is the, the road in the village, if you like. Mm -hmm. And uh, that car on the right there has, uh, well, I presume machine gun bullet holes uh, in yeah. it and, and in the seats as well. So you just wonder what the history of, of, of that car would have been. So I can tell you in most of these villages here, when the tanks would actually come in, um, and I actually have a an interview from a couple hundred days ago where I sat in a basement bunker with an older gentleman, and he told us exactly what happened when his village, and it's not Mirni, but it was actually uh, a sister village to this over a few kilometers. And um, he told us that when the tanks actually came in, they went house by house, and it was one shot per tank, and it was boom, house gone, boom, house gone. Boom, house gone. And then the soldiers on foot just randomly fired everything. Damaging cars, just destruction, guys. That's what that's yeah. what they do. Yeah, insane. That's the S300, uh, mm -hmm. well, the remnant of the an S300 that's, missile. That's our, that's our office. That's where Kirill and I do business. Yeah. And that's Pierre sitting on that. So uh, mm -hmm. this is, you know, something that they found on, on the grounds. And uh, it, it's quite incredible to see that. I mean, it's a sizable bit of kit. And the, these are the surface-to-air missiles that end up being used in the ground attack mode. And then having them, you know, fl fl they, these particularly are flung into Kharkiv uh, routinely and also Zaporizhia and Dnipropetrovsk. So yeah, those are the three places that get a lot of S-300 attention. Um, Adrian, yeah. thank you for that uh, two hundred uh, that thousand dollar donation. That was that was in there. I had just gotten called right before we went live, so thank you for that. Um, uh, that's that's there in the in the total. <clears throat> um, this wasn't supposed to be a particularly a fundraising one, but uh, <laughs> it's great for for being that. So thanks, Robert Lockhart, who said let's make two hundred thousand uh, today. That'd be absolutely insane. It would be. Uh, thank you uh, so much for that. Just a few thanks before we get on to, uh, I'll have a look at the mapping next. And there's a few points of interest to, to chat with you, Greg, about. Uh, Richard Bennett gifting 580p geopolitics uh, memberships. Really appreciate that, Richard. Always a great supporter, as is Brian Ivey. Uh, thanks, Brian. Really appreciate you, mate. Um, and for your channel, Barfly Ch uh, Chef has become a member. So thanks for doing that for Greg. Yeah, thank uh, you. Kevin Forst has uh, gifted 10 of your memberships. So Kevin's you, a, Kevin. such a wonderful person. Yes. Um, SRUSA54, thank you very much. You are a, a trusted member of the team here. So I really appreciate that. That's incredibly generous. Uh, thank you very much. It allows me to keep doing what I do. Uh, five memberships from iBagM for you as well, Greg. Um, thank you. And thank you. then back to Robert Lockhart, who's, who's rallying cry there. Uh, thanks, Robert. And and those those people that you just mentioned who have who yes. previously added, yeah they added... were they were doing it via our um, our nonprofit portal via PayPal or direct donation. So yes, we're trying to catch them. Yeah, and and who was that? Just just giving some props. Uh, uh, Adrian gave a thousand earlier. Um, yeah, he's, such, he's um, yeah. Linda S in Australia. Um, wow. There was uh, Javier, I think. Uh, there was there was others. I, I can't keep up with it now. So thank you. Incredible. Thank you. Yes. Incredible. Um, right. So now I'm going to go back to the map. Um, and there was a few points of interest that I thought uh, I'd like your opinion on. Well, the first one is just <laughs> just mentioning the Malloy drone, because you mentioned this last time we spoke. I think he did mm -hmm. saying that actually this the British made Malloy drone and that there are several variants of these. Some of them are big enough to be able to carry human bodies, but it wasn't those ones, but the smaller ones. A heavy lift drone has proven itself in Ukraine and will be in service to our Royal Marines. Acquiring proven platforms that can be upgraded, like the T-150, is key to our defense drone strategy. I would, The reason I've mentioned this is because not only did you mention the Malloy drone, I don't know if it's that particular one, but I was talking about this in my video this morning, that, that there's no such thing as a... Uh, as as a free lunch. So when we give as nations stuff to Ukraine, it's part of our strategic planning, which is like, okay, what's the first thing we want? We want Russia not to win. We want Ukraine to prevail. Uh, and so we are going to help Ukraine with military equipment. And so there's that element of it. We just want you to win the war. Okay. The second thing is, wouldn't it be great if uh, we stimulate our own economy 
Uh, and so we're going to build stuff ourselves to get that to Ukraine. And that creates tax dollars and it creates jobs and so on and so forth. And the money that we uh, are giving to Ukraine, actually, we aren't giving it to Ukraine. We're giving it to ourselves. And that allows us to give stuff to Ukraine, either old stuff or new stuff that we build. And if so, we give old, old stuff, we replace the old stuff with new stuff. So I have literally sat on one of those and lifted it. And I work right with the guys who do that from the Ukrainian side. Um, so I can confirm, yes, they're, they're there, they're working, and I can even confirm that there are more there than are officially stated by the Ministry of Defense of the UK, because they were actually sending them initially um, illegally. I, I mean, interesting. <laughs> yeah. Well, see, I heard, I heard let, me, let me explain oh, yeah. why. Because the red tape was so hard to get those transferred in, uh, the UK actually sent some guys down to bring them into the country and get them here so that Ukraine could start using them while they were trying to get the red tape sorted out. Um, so I, it's... That's, that's an interesting point, because when I, I know some people in the armed forces, I know a former tank commander, I know all sorts of uh, random people. And someone's telling me, we've officially given 14 Challenger 2 tanks to the to Ukraine. But there were room... Well, my information was we gave at least double that but we only officially gave 14. And so there are there are claims that we gave possibly 22, possibly 28 mm -hmm. uh, Challenger 2 tanks. Now, I don't know if that's true because the official line is still 14. And everyone yes. said to be given 14. Whether we gave more than that, I don't know. But it's, I'm not sure about similar, similar. I'm not sure about tanks and things that are that large that have to go on the back yeah. of these big trucks. But I can tell now that drone right there is massive, guys. So yeah. um, it, <laughs> I sat on it. So there, yeah. that tells you how it could have lifted me off the ground, possibly. Yeah. Um, Certainly so one of the those, ones. Those, can, can those the literally body. can be thrown in the back of a truck and moved. Uh, but you're not going to do that with a tank. you know. No. So, so I can just tell you they're there for sure. And the last thing I was going to say about strategic, you know, no such thing as a free lunch. When we give uh, things like drones that are particularly cutting edge technology, what we're doing is we're doing R&D back in the UK, for example, or any country where you're saying, right, what do Ukraine need? They need this. Okay, let's get feedback from there. Let's design this. Let's send that to the battlefield. Okay, let's use it. Let's get feedback from that. Let's let's put that into the feedback loop. And we are continually uh, upgrading this bit of kit so that it's really good and does a really good job on, on the Ukrainian battlefield. But what we're really doing is we're tooling our own armed forces up to make sure that if we are have to go to war, we are the ones that are have the, the, the latest tech that is most effective and it's been battle tested on the front lines in the most updated war in the world and we so what we're doing is we're investing in our own national security so when we give stuff like that and we we become members of drone coalitions and we, we're trying to help ukraine we are also helping ourselves now i'm not trying to say this is all selfish but i am mm -hmm. trying to say that that you know when we help ukraine there is a lot of self-interest involved in that so it's not just overt charity to ukraine of course there is it's um uh, nations are learning a lot in this war right now. Um, Holy Oblation 50, thank you for that. I'm trying to keep up the chat now because people are directly donating. Jamie Snow, uh, 20 to Bethel to try to pack, uh, pop this over. Um, we're rolling, guys. Yeah, that's amazing. Thank mm -hmm. you so much for this. A bit of an impromptu, um, yeah. uh, impromptu fundraiser. So th thank you for all of that. I incredible. Um, so ne next uh, conversation point I, I wanted to bring up with you, and this is something I keep hearing, but either in terms of a localized area, like the, the common one that I hear, Greg, is that Kupiansk area is the next bigger place and they're amassing troops and they're going to attack Kupiansk and that's, oh, we've got to be careful up in the Kupiansk down to Svatova to Liman area, Crimea area, that they've got 100,000 troops Russians. But I've been told that for a year and nothing's really changed for a year. So I'm always quite well, there, there, there is there is something that's changed. Um, king of the geopolitical world. <laughs> Vladimir Putin's been reelected. So there is a change. And I'm going to tell uh, you, I'm going to okay. tell you right now, they're coming. Yeah, they're coming. I have heard it from every commander from Sumy to Kharkiv to Kupiansk. We're going to lose Chasiv Yar soon. I'm telling you, just like I told you we were going to lose Abdivka six weeks before it happened. It's going to happen. We're going to lose Robotny. 
And the commanders in Robotny and Arikiv told me when we lose Arikiv, we're going to lose 50 kilometers instantly, instantly 50 kilometers. Of yeah, and, th and th this is so. Actually, let's let's bring that up on a map. So this is one of the things I've been talking about about how well this doesn't have intrinsic value, Robotino or Robitney area. That that it it. But what it does do is it forces the fight to happen here and not up here, and that's mm -hmm. the same for an awful lot of places. It's like you've got to fight somewhere, and we'd much rather fight it as far away from where where our main arteries are as possible. And Thank so you, Johnny Christensen. Uh, so, and I know you know this, but guys, when you look at that map right there, let me just explain one thing to you. Orikiv is in a hole. It is way down a hill in a valley. And it it is way low. And when Russia is over here on the left pushing, they're actually having the high ground. You can see the hills up above Orikiv behind it. So this is looking south from mm -hmm. Orikiv. Now, it might not look, this is one-to-one, -one, so it doesn't look like massive, but that is an incline that goes up and up and up. There's no towards, question. Towards, it, towards it, the it's high ground. And Orikiv yeah. sits down in this little low, you can see it, little low bottom there. And um, that's why Ukraine doesn't want to fight in Orikiv because they would be at a disadvantage with uh, high ground, much like we've experienced in the East. And these yeah. are all farming fields that go up and down um, and, and over to the left there, it really, if you go back to where Russia's pushing in, if you go up towards Nova, Nova Andrivka, um, that not Nova Andrivka, but right to the right of it, it's a little higher, higher Ridge right there. And this is, you know, so this is it, in, in the bottom right hand side, some of you might not be able to see it. There's a, there's a height. Uh, there, so this is Novandrivka is 61 meters, mm -hmm. and that's rising up and up and up. This is 110 meters, so you can see that that's uh, rising to 112, 130 meters, pretty much here. So you can see that, yeah, the, these are these settlements, and Orikiv Ori is 33 meters. Hello, so sir. You, oh, hold you on. Can see, that's do that again. I, Greg's telling you the truth. I was just there. So. What was did you say? One thirty-three to thirty-three. No, it's sort of. So the lowest point I've seen around uh, Orikiv is so, it, Orikiv itself is sort of thirty to sixty meters. Okay. And then as you come south, it's sort of one hundred and fifteen meters, okay. one hundred and twenty-five, sort of one hundred and thirty, maybe. Exactly. So it's noticeable, guys. Yeah. It's noticeable. Yeah. yeah. And and so if they get to here, obviously that means Orikiv will be just basically mm -hmm. they'll be easily yeah. taking it out. And the problem coming out of Orikiv, so if you do your th same thing and put it in Orikiv, um, so you're at that 30, 40, 50, 60, 60 40, mm -hmm. 48, now, yeah. Now go go up go up that road right there. Go no Just go north. And that goes up to 100, yeah. So I'm, I'm telling again, you, it's it's in a hole. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's so, a very so, good feature. You just taught me something, JP. I like that. <laughs> yeah, it's good. That, that is very useful. Um, so... Uh, that that is that is certainly a challenge. And uh, so going back to the the question is the economy. Well, not the question. The, the the claim here from the economist is that spring in Ukraine uh, is brings with it a fear that Russia will mount a big new offensive. Ukraine's ability to hold it off this time looks much less sure than it did then. That's why they urgently need to mobilize more troops and build more robust frontline defenses. Now, speaking of both of those issues. Interestingly, frontline defences are being built quite considerably. In fact, I think I've got some imagery of this to share with you. Uh, yeah, so here we have uh, the construction of defensive lines and structures continues in all directions of the front. And in fact, the Zaporizhia area that we're just looking at, the Orokiv area, I, I was under the impression that Zaporizhia has the... the um, had supposedly got the best built defenses. They've been building them there fairly well for a long time. And it's other areas like Avdivka that they've that they've lacked them. But Zaporizhia, uh, here we have special anti-drone equipment being installed. I do wonder, like, if you can't, if these end up being completely tunnels, like, you've got to be able to shoot out them at some point and get it. So I wonder how that all works. But anyway, point B. They put the, they put the pill they put the pills up on top of it. Yeah. Um, the concrete things. Uh, the, the, so, the, point, the point being that 
Um, okay, the fortifications are being built, but the Russians, uh, post-election, as was always thought to be the case, that they were going to mobilise after the election, there could be 300,000 people suddenly, or maybe more, thrown at the, at, at the Russian armed forces. How well trained they'll be, how well equipped they'll be, that's another question. But you can expect a national mobilisation going forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then, and then therefore happen. a big attack, and then and then a big attack, whether it be up in Kupiansk, whether it be down here, whether it be all over the place, or whether it even include coming across the borders into Kharkiv, because there are some rumours that they still intent on taking Kharkiv as well. I don't know that the Russians would be able to manage something like that, but the threat is there. The threat is there, and we we would have to see on that. Um, I personally feel they can. Yeah. Um, because Ukraine is, um, so I'll just tell you straight, they are not as, they're having to put the maximum amount of their soldiers actually on that Kupiansk all the way to Robotny lines. And it is not as well staffed as it needs to be. Let, let's yeah. just leave it at that. Are, are there military there? Are there soldiers there? Um, yes. Greg, do I follow the link above? Donate to the ambulances. Yes, you do. Um, and somebody else, either it's going so fast, I can't keep up now. But thank you, everybody. Thank you. And we'll we'll catch it. Um, so it, it'll be interesting. I can tell you right now, Johnny, over the last 36 hours, there were some mandatory evacuations coming out of north of Kharkiv. Um, and that's due to the increased shelling and the increase in glide bombs. So it's a couple of towns just north of Kharkiv. So that's that's not the best. Um, so I mean, what the okay? The good news is that Sursky came in and did an audit and found out that a massive number of troops hadn't been rotated to the front line, and there was a really inefficient use of Ukrainian troops, or at least inefficient rotations or non-existent rotations. So the good thing that came out of that is that suddenly a bunch of troops were able to be used. Uh, which would then mitigate the need to mobilize inst like they need to mobilize of course they need to mobilize and we all re recognize that but at least there was the ability to get some more troops through that auditing process as i understand it but i presume the vakovna rada is is the ukrainian parliament is trying to desperately work out how to mobilize without change and, and they can't they they're they're in gridlock much like us is and um it's it just going to take time, guys. It's going to take time. And unfortunately, right now, Ukraine doesn't have um, that time. We need to get supply here. We need to get decisions made. And we need to get much more active than we are now. Um, Captain Heimars asked on my channel, how can Ukraine handle the glide bombs before the fighting jets will come? They can't, period. Um, uh, is there anything the volunteers help clean up Chris? Crystal light. Well, I, I, I would I would answer that that they probably can, but it would mm -hmm. require being very risky with air defense, which is what they did. So the way I understand it is is that and we were calling for this for so long, which is like mm -hmm. bring a patriot close to the front line to do some really risky popping off at Russian VKS or dropping these glide bombs. And it did take a long time, but they did do it around the Dnipro River and they took out a bunch of uh, Sukhoi uh, fighters in the Kherson Oblast. And they did it in, in Zaporizhia. They, they took out some around Mariupol and they took out the A-50s around there. Uh, and then they did it around Avdivka and took out some some planes there. So they can do something about it. But the problem well, it, there, is... There's a, different, there's a difference in the question, can and are they? Yeah, yeah. So, well, so they can they? That, but... Yes. But right now they're so weak, Johnny. I'm telling yeah. you. I've yeah. just come off this entire front line. They're so weak. This is why you've seen Russia hit the energy infrastructure pretty much how they want to this yeah. week. Um, yeah, Patriots yeah. would stop them. F-16s would stop them. And Ukraine has the skill to stop them. But now they're having to pick and choose yeah, where they're exactly. moving these defenses. And and so when they lost those two launchers, and okay, the launchers are not the most serious part of the battery, luckily. So they lost two launchers, uh, Patriot launchers around uh, Donetsk that were doing that yes. job. And that's the risk. So you're like, right, we've got a percentage, you know, we are going to risk losing these 
But we're, if we don't do it, then we're going to risk losing our troops and key positions because these glide bombs are bastards. And so, therefore, it's like move these forward, take out some some air airframes, which they did, but then they lost some launchers. Is that's the that's the game they have to play because then it's like okay, so now we can't bring those two particular launchers back to defend a say, for example, a, a combined heat and power plant if they were being used to do that. I'm not saying they they were, but you know, you, my analogy is always you've got a blanket that's not big enough for your country for your bed but right? you pull the blanket one one in one direction to keep you warm over here and your feet get cold over there so then you pull the blanket back over there and it it, it lays bare another part of your bed that's the air defense situation both in ukraine and in russia and neither side has enough air defenses to defend their country from the other side that's and correct the, the question then is, it's a dilemma. So it's not a problem that has a solution. It's a dilemma that has your least worst uh, outcome. And so what, what do you give up? Do you give up your troops on the front line or do you give up a power plant or do you give up uh, something in Kiev or whatever? And, and I don't know the answer to that, but that's the problem. That, those are the issues I have. Why would a NATO nation and a neighbor of Ukraine allow a missile to fly over their airspace for 39 or, seconds? So I've... Can I answer that? Yeah. So uh, my analogy, and my, my viewers will have heard this. So my analogy, I think, is, is spot on. Tell me if it's not. So if if uh, Russia... So I worked out at 800 kilometers an hour at 39 seconds over Poland. That would have covered about nine and a half kilometers or something like that, nine kilometers. What would Poland have done had Russia sent... Uh, a convoy of infantry fighting vehicles with troops on that is going to attack Ukraine, but sent them nine kilometers through Polish uh, territory to then come into the Ukraine and attack Ukraine. They would never have allowed that. A missile does the same thing. They're just different forms of weaponry. Some are people, some are missiles. If you allow a missile to do that, then you effectively would allow troops to do that. You wouldn't allow troops to do that, so why have you allowed a missile to do that? However, they have gone away and thought about this, and NATO has announced, I think, broadly, that they would shoot it down now, and they might even shoot it down going into Ukrainian territory. This is what is being discussed. If that's the case, that's good, and that's right, and that's what should be the case, but it should have been shot down initially. Anyway, that's my We point. completely agree agree and all i can tell you is all that does is embolden vladimir putin exactly it's very simple guys and would they shoot the next one down i highly doubt it to be quite honest with you um there's a bunch of cowards running around um it'll be it, really it, interesting to see that actually because i i hope they will they've talked about it and they yeah. surely know that if they allow russia to keep pushing the envelope they'll just keep pushing the envelope more you've got to at some point just go no that ain't gonna happen are, are we having fun on my chat? They must be having fun. They want the mods to jump in. Uh, I this I, I snuck this live stream on people, um, so I didn't get it to them in time. It's set up. You know, Johnny puts me on crazy times with that UK stuff because you have to stream with Johnny um, when uh, he's between cups of tea. Yeah. So you have to make sure. Uh, additionally, guys, if there are uh, clowns in our chat, don't worry about them because. Uh, they're not here so yeah yeah they're they're paid to do that they don't have those you i i always say that if you really believe that if you really believe what you're saying then you're a moral monster uh, otherwise you're paid to say that and either way it doesn't look good the jog on no, no but um deal. but uh, yeah so i i think the key and you kind of long been saying this and they're still saying this is air defense air defense air defense and and it needs to be the best air defenses and i think you know i've been singing france's praises recently, Greg, because Emmanuel Macron, Sebastian Lecornu, their, their defense minister, their, their prime minister, Atal, their, um, they've got a mission over at the moment in Kiev with uh, some of their, their speaker of parliament and also people in France are saying the right things in the right positions. And they're now putting their own defense industry on a, on a war footing. Macron is an, no Le Cornu announced the other day that they will be, they will be okay for taking over private defense concerns if mm -hmm. they need to to get them to make things at the right 
the right levels. They just announced yesterday that um, they are no longer going to export to any other country than Ukraine for, for when they get rid of um, equipment that gets replaced. So they've got all these replacement schedules going on, which will include AMX-10 RCs, these light tanks with on wheels, and also VAB armor personnel carriers and all sorts of other stuff. They will exclusively now go to Ukraine. This is all really good news, which is like R France are saying there is only one issue at the moment globally that we need to concern ourselves with, and that is Ukraine. And that's that's exactly what we need to happen. But we need that with everyone. Um, but but they make Santi France, um, which is a patriot equivalent. I don't know how good it is at taking. There's there's no data really to show how good it is at taking out ballistic missiles. But we know Patriot can. So those two systems, and we know U Ukraine have bought five directly. Five Patriot batteries are due to turn up in Ukraine. There was there was a rumor. Zelensky announced the other night that two more air defense systems have turned up that can shoot down everything. So there's a theory that that you've just received. Ukraine has just received two more uh, Patriot batteries, but there are supposed to be five that Ukraine have bought directly from RTX from Raytheon. So going forward, some good news, but they just need, instead of five, they need 10. Instead of 10, they need 20. Just that's what they need, and they need a damn sight load of them. Yeah. Um, I, um, James, if you're in there, I popped you on as a moderator, brother. I trust you to keep an eye on it for me. Um, so, yeah, it's... Johnny, we, we, we continually get back to timing. And you come back to the issue that Ukraine needs um, supplies or stuff, as you call it. And then additionally, really, guys, to work out this this um, mobilization issue. Mm. It, it's mm. very important right now. And I, I, I would love to see kind of all this stuff come together at one time. Mobilizations being fixed, guys being trained, guys being rotated, supply coming, F-16s coming, and let's see what happens. Because that that's where we need to be. Um, it, it, it will be. It's like, like because sometimes I get really depressed about like the state of affairs, right? And you think, and you and you see the destruction done to civilians in in towns, uh, villages, towns, and cities right across Ukraine every night and every. And you think, okay, it's obvious who the good guys are, who the bad guys are. I know that's simplistic, but it's bloody true, right? So, uh, and then you think, uh, okay, they're going to mobilize three hundred thousand people or whatever. Putin can do but then then I go okay what what do we have to to be more you know, satisfied with well on the mobilization front for Russia are they able to train and equip 300 to 500,000 people so there's one thing saying Russia can do that but actually the logistics of that will be absolutely horrific for Russia because one I, they won't be able to train. They haven't got the logistics to train those people. So they're just going to be throwing broadly untrained people in. Two, they don't have the equipment for those people. I'm fairly sure of that. Three, extracting three to 500,000 people out of their economy like that in their economy. I, there are elements of screws turning on the Russian economy. I know, I know people think it's all too slow and this and that. But America, as much as Congress is screwed at the moment, are doing things behind the scene that I think mm -hmm. is actually quite effective. So you're starting to see Chinese and Indian banks no longer do things, take on Russian money because the US is turning the screws with secondary sanctions on those banks. So the US is doing important stuff that they can do, irrespective of the fact they can't get equipment to to Ukraine. So anyway, point is that you take five, three to five hundred thousand people out of the Russia, Russian economy, they are screwed, and 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 they're already having issues with selling hydrocarbons and all sorts of stuff. So the good news is that if they do attack big time going forward this year and into next, then actually it could be Russia's last word of the dice, really, in yeah. terms of in terms of any sustainable future. But on the other hand, Ukraine still needs to be able to defeat unarmed or poorly armed, poorly equipped, poorly trained soldiers. There are still boots on the ground that can generally fire an old AK-47 or something. So they still need mobilization. But I do get, I, I am slightly buoyed by Europe's response at the moment in light of the lack of American aid. So I would agree I, with that completely, Johnny. And I think it's also, um, they're starting to see some handwriting on the wall after this election, you know, 
there was questions. Okay, are we going to, is is this going to kind of relax, not in, but relax a little bit now post-election? And people were wondering, maybe the election's been done, there'll be a little chill, it'll get more time for Ukraine um, to be supplied and get their mobilization taken care of. But we're seeing that it's actually not. And now I think Europe is waking up to the fact that we need to crank it up here. It doesn't look like the U.S. can uh, come together right now. And we're every day that ticks by, we're March the 28th right now. And every day that ticks by, we're one day closer to November. And our country continues to have chaos and chaos. Um, so we have to be, uh, you, you, EU says, okay, so we have to jump in. We have to step in. We have to do what's right. Um, so I, 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 I'm hoping that that will continue. Yeah, and, and, uh, I, and I think it really is. I think the EU is definitely doing a, a, a much better job of stepping up. I think Macron and some of the leaders have, have really had some road to Damascus moment of, of realisation, to use a, a religious phrase for you there, Greg, just to make you happy. Um, but uh, you, you know, it, I think... I think that is happening. I think Germany's really stepped up, even without the tourists. They've they've still done. They're still the biggest donor outside of of the US. Uh, and it, I'm interested in things like Greece. So Greece has suddenly come to the party, uh, and this is again going back to give America some the US some props because the US real. My opinion is that that the DoD, the Department of Defense in in the US and the Biden administration, realize that they can't do anything with military aid because their hands are tied with the Congress impasse. And as a result, they're saying, right, since we can't do that, we need to do double the amount of stuff outside of giving our own aid to Ukraine. So let's mobilize our our ability, our our diplomats and and whatever to get stuff done. And so sanctions are being focused on but also twisting people's arms like Turkey starting I, I don't know if people have realized last few days as the US has made bilateral contracted um uh, request for explosives from Turkey. So Turkey are going to help the US get their artillery ammunition production up. So when when you do get the green light for aid, the US has got loads of artillery ammunition. Uh, Turkey's involved in that and also getting Turkish ammunition, I think, to Ukraine, but also Greece, as I mentioned. Now, Greece are being given F-35s, I believe, from the US. They're selling them to Greece. But I think part of the arrangement was we will only sell you F-35s if you give all of your old Soviet era gear to Ukraine. And that's quite a lot of stuff. So you, Greece are now giving some S-300s and munition and I think some books maybe and so a bunch of other stuff that is really important for Ukraine. And they're also... Uh, getting rid of older airframes such as F-16s and Mirages. Mm -hmm. So there's now the theory that Greece are going to be able to sell, might, might not be giving, but be selling F-16s and Mirages to, to Ukraine. This is all, you know, again, looking good. But it, but I imagine a lot of influence is being put on them, uh, a lot of pressure is being put on them by the US. So the US is still playing a major part, irrespective of the fact that it can't get that aid directly to Ukraine. Anyway, just, uh, right now, while that's happening, right this very minute, there is a mass cyber attack on Ukrainian television and it is broadcasting Russian propaganda. Really? This second. Which is something Ukrainians have done to the Russians. They're doing the same not, thing. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah. No, no, no. Uh, but, but, but it's, it's, it's a shame. Not, it's, yeah. it's the warfare is multifaceted. I think yeah. that's what people need to remember. Yes, we have a front line that looks like World War I. And it's just horrible. We have the media war. We have the corruption war. We have foreign governments war. We have uh, technology war. We have uh, propaganda as and both are pushing on each other, rightfully so. I mean, this is warfare and behind lines activity. This is a war that the world hasn't seen in a long time. You know, we've seen uh, wars, you know in the Middle East, or we've seen wars that um, African nations warring against each other with tribal wars or cultural wars that have happened. But it's been a long time since something of this level. I don't know that, that we've ever seen a war like this because you've got the conventional war, you've got the threat of nuclear, 
uh, you've got sanctions, so you've got the economic war, uh, and this involves not just the countries taking part in the war, but all the allies on each side. Uh, you've got cyber war and you've got mm -hmm. information war. This is all happening, and it's a confluence of all these different different domains. Uh, I don't think we've ever seen a war that, that that's been quite like this, and and yeah, it, incredible stuff. Um, just well, to, and, and, yeah. and, and to be quite honest, you know, we can take it from Pete the other day. Um, understanding the drone warfare it, and not so much the larger drones, not talking about Shahids and, and vampires and all of these. We're talking about the FPV drones that at some at some times there's so many in the air, even from both sides. Yeah, it, it sound he called it a, a swarm of locusts. Yeah. You, you don't even dare lift your head up out of the hole. Yeah. Um, so this is a, a new type of, of warfare that the world is um, learning through yeah. uh, this war in Ukraine. You know, drones have been around for decades, but this type of FPV drone um, has has really changed the warfare. So you're right. I even call it, Johnny, to be quite honest, I call it a civil U.S. civil war all the way until – modern warfare futuristic everything is happening right now whether it's just random artillery being shot and no aim nothing lining these sides up um all the way into futuristic warfare i'm sure things are happening we haven't heard and uh can't even understand to be quite honest yeah and, and like i i think this is our war and it's our war because you know, the Russians and apparently the Chinese are very much at the moment starting to do this. But the Russians have been involved in information warfare. And you can bet your bottom dollar that opinions that you are being um, subjected to, particularly on social media, are are being amplified or that wedge is being knocked into the, the crack by the Russian information warriors if you like the troll farms and so that that civil war that culture war that's taking place in the u.s at the moment between republicans and democrats fighting over all all these sometimes quite frivolous things in my opinion uh certainly compared to something like an actual world war going on in, in ukraine but that is exactly what Russia wants. They want the US to be divided and to be con concerned about all these other things so that they can go and do stuff in, in in Ukraine. And so there is a kind of civil war going on in so many countries around the world. And Russia is taking one of those sides in those different countries. And they will be amplifying the most divisive rhetoric there in order that you concentrate on the wrong things. And we need to see through the fog to the clarity of what is going on in Ukraine, because that's the, that's that's where the actual war is taking place. Um, well, I think that um, you, Johnny, have done a phenomenal job, and I support you one million percent educating your community on this and being so faithful with your updates nonstop. Uh, you have risked your own life to come here, and it's appears you may risk it again in the future to come here again i've tried to do the same but mine is experiential living um here years of my life speaking the language um all of these things you know you put, start putting all these together and we, we have a great team um but what's beautiful is i'm watching both of our chats right now and people they get it they're saying yes this is our war so we just need to amplify that message out more and more and more that this is our war. And as we do that, I believe um, I, I still I say it every time I'm on my stream. Well, not every time, every time I, it works into the to the talk. But uh, or if I'm a guest on someone else's stream, I still believe that um, I still believe that grassroots efforts can persuade massive governments to change i really yeah, believe that i hope so i mean it's quite depressing someone reached out to me this morning one of my uh one of my viewers on uh, on my facebook group uh to, to say he messaged me to say that he's been banned from facebook uh for 
standing up to Russian propaganda. So he's calling out Russian propaganda and, and all the trolls there report him and he gets banned because that's what the algorithms will do because you get, and this is what this is what the Russian trolls do. If they report people, they do it with YouTube and YouTube comments or YouTube channels and Twitter, again, the system. And he's banned on Facebook for standing up for what is good and right and proper. And it's really depressing. Um, but there you go. Um, um, let me do this, Johnny. Yep. So I, I'm seeing it, even the questions in there, what are we raising funds for ambulances, armored, the armored vehicles? And I'm talking to Pastor Kent now. We're at 198 700 So Ooh. we've raised over uh, 2700 on this on this stream. So and guys, we weren't we, even planning on it. <laughs> no, no. We're now 1300 from there. And um, so let's talk just a few more minutes here, Johnny. And I don't want you to miss your spot of tea, but we're so, getting really the, close guys. And our team there with Pastor Kent and our administrators are watching it right now on our secure donation. Um, the reality uh, is, Greg, is that I'm more likely to need to go to the toilet than, than get another tea. Cause my, um, uh, my okay. Russian war, what my Russian warship FU mug has the, the contents of which have been long drained, but they are filtering through my system. And I might Just, need to leave okay, you. Okay, let me let me ask you a question. Do you need to go right now? Well, I always need to go, but I'll, I'll, I'll hold on and do the mapping first, and then I might have to pass over to you. Okay, so I do need to go right now. All right, so I'll, do, I'll do the mapping. Go to the mapping. I'll hop right back in. Go to your single cube because, man, Good on I've you, been mate. drinking so much water. I'm, I'm a, I need a diaper. Maybe we should both do this at the same time. Just leave dead. No, air. then people will leave. You keep talking. I need a diaper. Okay. Right. okay. Uh, see you in a minute. I'll take you out. Right. Uh, over to me. Sorry, guys. Uh, it's only me. Right, we're going to go to the front line now and uh, see what is uh, taking place. I'm going to move that to another screen. One of the greatest things I decided to do was buy a second screen for, obviously most people do have this, and as a YouTuber, people have like nine screens. I am behind the curve, but second screen is the most useful thing in the world. Right, okay. Uh, I'm going to start, before I go to the mapping, I want to start with something, and those on my channel will know about this issue, and I actually spoke about this this morning in one of my, uh, in my, one of my news update videos, but I found this really interesting. So, uh, Andrew Perpetua, as a mapper, and if you go to my map, you will note that there are many lines on my map. Uh, on my map, I have, uh, well, the, the, the main Russian defensive lines are denoted by the blue line here, which is Andrew Perpetua. He's a pro, pro Ukrainian mapper, but actually he's really objective. Yellow is deep state map that's pro Ukrainian and red is at Suriat maps pro Russian. There's often a difference in the mappers. Uh, let's go to a, a very good example of this, which is a place to the south of Avdivka. So you've got the Avdivka salient here and you've got a place called Novelska. So what happens with Syriac Maps is he says, as soon as the Russians set foot anywhere, or if there's a vehicle that's gone, gone somewhere, or there's a human being, even if they are obliterated and blown up because it's actually a gray zone, that he will say, right, the Russians control that because I've seen a Russian human being there. Uh, and this causes a bit of consternation between the mappers because here's an example where the Russians definitely do not control Novelska as according to all the latest data. And the, but Syriac Maps has... The Russians in control of Novelska. Okay, I'm giving you that context to, to, so that you understand this. So these are Russian sources saying this. Okay, the first one says on the thread more and more strange, uh, which is a thread I think that they add stuff to. Our infantry fighting vehicle was going on the attack. The infantry fighting vehicle was knocked out and the assault group was destroyed. Ukrainians and then our bloggers sketched the place where they finished off the group with drops behind us. And the heading more and more strange. We continue. Four of our infantry fighting vehicles were traveling. Three were shot down. One returned. Two infantry fighting vehicles managed to land troops at the very extreme point. A group of six people landed and were covered with artillery, Ukrainians. And then our bloggers drew this on the map in red. What they're trying to say is that on the map, we were... So the point of this last... Um, comment is exactly what I've just said. So this is, we, they had four infantry fighting vehicles, three were blown up and one returned. They managed to drop some people off, but they were completely, they were destroyed by artillery. But even though that happened, our bloggers put that as red on the map, which is exactly what Surat Maps does and puts that as red on the map. 
but the Russians, by their own admission here, don't control that, that land. Now, it gets worse here. So then what happens, you get another comment here that says, on March the 23rd, this is in Ivanivska. So we're going to actually are going to go, go and find that. So Ivanivska is an area which is suffering, which the Russians are taking control of gradually. And it is this buffer zone between Bakhmut and Chazif Yar. This is where Greg Terry has just been. And he will no doubt update you. I'll just add him back here. But this is fascinating stuff. So uh, recently we've heard that, well, Suryat Maps is a pro-Russian mapper said days and days ago that the Russians took control of Ivaniska. And he said that because the Russian MOD announced it. But straight away, the claims from the Ukrainians, and even though they are likely to, to lose Ivaniska, and they might have even lost it already now, but the point is that they didn't lose it at the time that Suryat Map said they lost it. And in fact, the Ukrainians still controlled, or at least half of it was grey zone, right? And then... And then this was a comment from a Russian on March 23rd. So this is five days ago. The Russian Ministry of Defense announced that it had taken control of the village of Ivanivska, which is when Suryat maps changed to having the control in the backward direction. The information is absolutely and completely untrue, says the Russian. However, this information was not intended for Russian citizens and certainly not ours, but exclusively for Russian soldiers who were sent to the western part of the village on the 23rd, the 24th and the 25th, having previously shown a statement from the Russian Ministry of Defense about complete control over Ivanivska. In other words, they, they were under the impression that they controlled the whole village and then sent their troops to the western side of it, thinking that they controlled it. Naturally, the Russian fighters not only failed to reach the western part of the village, they also did not have time to enter the central part because Ukrainian armed forces inflicted fire on them along Shurikaya Street and Artyoma Lane in the eastern part of Ivaniska. And then finally... OK, on your fingers, uh, Ukrainian bloggers draw territories on maps for us, misleading us. I would argue it's actually Russian mill bloggers that do this. Our bloggers happily draw the same way that Ukrainians do. Too often, what was sketched by Ukrainian bloggers began to not coincide with information from the field. In general terms, all this drawn on the maps by Ukrainians is taken as exact proof that is, is so. I, so anyway, translated is... The Russians appear to be actually using these open source intelligence maps as their own intelligence and doing attacks into places that doesn't coincide with reality. And they end up losing troops because they think they uh, they control places they don't actually control. And this is absolutely incredible to the point where tongue in cheek, Andrew Perpetua says killing Russians with maps is a fine art us mappers are very dangerous people. But but the point there, uh, and this may not be widespread, this may only happen here and now and on, on occasion, but it, it, it makes me wonder what the intelligence is like for the Russians on the on the field, on the battlefield. If, do they, we, we hear sometimes that they don't communicate very well between different uh, elements on the battlefield, between different units, and this is the same for the Ukrainians, like there, there are issues for both sides, of course. But if they are using open source intelligence to then think that they control somewhere and then then do a maneuver on the basis of that and then they don't control that area and then lose those vehicles as is being claimed then that to me is just it blows my mind like you would never ever have the US army ever ever doing something like that like going on the internet and saying, well, we control that because I saw it on some map or on the internet. Do you have US intelligence, satellite imagery, you know, all sorts of drones and all sorts of stuff, and they, they won't Okay, be Okay, so just remember, though, remember, you have to continue to remember the Soviet mindset of military action. Human life is not valuable. Yeah. So even if they're working off of wrong intelligence or if they have the right intelligence, but yeah. they just want to meat grind it. Yeah. They'll just send them in there. They don't yeah. care. Ukraine is not that way. OK, so there is a difference. Now, Ukraine is having to break out of that mentality with certain commanders and they are. But uh, it doesn't surprise me at all. It surprise yeah. me at all that they would do that. But that's it, it's not only because of intelligence or mapping or the, the drone reports back it's also mentality yeah yeah and they 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 do have that you know send send the troops in and you hear this anecdotally but so consistently that it's more than an anecdote from the russian uh testimony testimonial videos mm -hmm. that they release saying they're just using us as, as meat attacks can we stop it but 
you why change something why fix something is not broke so for them like as horrible as that is and as inefficient as that is it still sort of works to the point where they are moving westwards and they are having like scare quotes success like you can ask in in historically looking back on this whether it it was a success by by the metrics of like it is one square kilometer worth 2000 people or whatever yeah um, history will tell history will tell and and time will tell um but but the reality I, I, is i, I will say it, i will say it this way i will say it this way right now um they had the initiative right now i think that's the fairest way to yeah. say it it's not yeah. like you know they're yes. on full bore full bore offensive but they do have the initiative my real concern johnny is not about even if skin chasifyar because behind that uh konstantinivka and kramatorsk and Druzhkovka and slavyansk ukraine is ready uh well prepared and has the high ground um my concern right now is more coming west out of um and I will tell you this stuff, guys, now uh, coming west out of Avdivka. Additionally, I'm also concerned about Krasnogorivka. Um, th that's a large place that we really do not want to lose just outside of Marinka up there above it. Um, those are challenges. Robotny, it, you know, what happens there is going to happen. But Krasnogorivka and the uh, western push out of Avdivka, you know, you're pushing on Pokrovsk, and then Pokrovsk is Karakova, yes, and then over to Pokrovsk, it's vitally important, vitally important. So we'll see. Um, I can tell you also that Ukraine is reinforcing at Odessa. Yes, yeah, so I find Odessa fascinating, mate, and the reason why I find it fascinating, so um, I just, I like using mm -hmm. my pen, so I'm just... No, yeah, listen, it is such a beautiful... Um, you're the best pen using MS guy on the planet. <laughs> Absolutely, no doubt. There's no that. quiver in your liver. <laughs> um, so Odessa is fascinating because this is the red line for Macron and France. Now, I find this really interesting and actually quite correct. So Macron has said, and he said this before the official announcement, so some leaks came out to say that he had so told people previously in a meeting that if the Ukrainians, uh, if the Russians get to Odessa, then you'll get French forces inside Ukraine. Now, his red line is Odessa, and I agree with that, because, because Odessa represents Ukraine's ability to do international trade, essentially. Mm -hmm. So if if... Ukraine lose Odessa, they effectively lose the entire seaboard here, which means they have no ability to transport their grain. And it also means that they'll lose all of this. With that, they'll lose all of this area that is um, as well, fertile area that's that's farming, farming area too. And Odessa is the third biggest city in Ukraine, which has its own um, economic value. And essentially, if Russia took control of this area to Transnistria, they would control Ukraine's uh, economy. They would they would destroy the economy, and they would they would themselves would have all of these trade routes and would control entirely control the Black Sea. And well, so that is me, right. That, that that is a red line for France. Let me tell you one thing right now. And this is this is I mean it's everybody. I mean not everybody knows this, but there's no intelligence here because I'm not giving locations but a massive amount of engineering equipment and tr and uh, uh gear is heading to odessa massive i and watched it i wonder i wonder whether that's for for then moving to mikhailov and then moving to uh, i uh, imagine or... i I, I do not know the answer to that. All I can or would, tell you would is... would it just be defensive? I like... Hmm. Yeah, I don't know. I can just tell you. Uh, Odessa is being targeted much more regularly than it was. There was a lull. Yeah. And, um, you know, you, you, you still have to keep in the back of your mind the Transnester region loaded with supply. Uh, whether it's old Soviet or not, it doesn't matter. It's still quantity. We're not worried about the amount of soldiers there, but the quantity of munitions and artillery 
there in in uh, Transnistria region, Tiraspol over there is is massive, and um, I, I don't know. I'm just telling you that we 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 keep our eyes on Odessa, Mikolaev, Hedersong. So one of the theories is that that's the biggest Russian haul of ammunition and equipment, uh, or the ammunition supplies. In, in basically in Russia is in Transnistria, so some theories are. And there are only, I say only, 1,500 Russian soldiers there who are probably not going to be your crack troops. Uh, if Ukraine went on the attack into Transnistria, that would be fascinating, but it could also, unless the Russians decided to blow up that supply, as if, if and that's your worry, but that, that could be on the cards. As you say, that could be why their troops are going to Odessa. That would be a really... That's, um, I don't know, but I can confirm to you one, I, you know, I've been there. Um, that is, that is Russia 1978 to 85. That's how they live. And absolutely, it's loaded with equipment. Absolutely. So there's not a question. In fact, I've even read that, that it's, it's the largest munitions dump in all of Europe. Yeah. Um, whether it is or not, I don't know, but I do know that um it's loaded yeah and and uh, yeah yeah i th i just think this is so odessa is so important like the russians the russian generals have said that it is your like minimum minimum objective for for the russians like if they're going to do anything it's taking this land bridge to transnistria that's what russian generals have been caught on camera saying mm -hmm. essentially i'm paraphrasing yeah. so you can talk about the donetsk you can talk about kharkiv but actually this area would be far more important it would give more protection to sevastopol and crimea it would give and it's just economically it would, it would destroy ukraine uh, and and so but ukraine as well if they can take not take Transnistria, but but take out the Russians there, get that equipment, and then help Moldova with Transnistria. Then I suppose that would be a, a bit of a bonus. But it could all also open up a massive can of political worms, geopolitical, like international diplomacy. I don't know how the international community would see that if if the Russians, if the Ukrainians did decide to do something like that. I don't know. Um, in, in terms of the front line, nothing's happened from Kupiansk to Kremina. Again, really stabilised front line here as far down as that salient by uh, Terny there. But certainly Kupiansk is really quietened down, despite the number of rumours about the Russians getting ready to attack big time around here. In fact, the Ukrainians have pushed the Russians back, supposedly, north of Sinkivka, which is fantastic news. That happened over the course of the last few days. Um, but yeah, even to be quiet around Terny is good news for the Ukrainians. They managed to push them back a little bit, the, the Russians here. The Russians, though, have pushed in other areas. So this is a dynamic area, the front line. But the Russians have lost quite a lot of equipment in this whole area. Andrew Perpetua's uh, um, mapping has, has shown that and his geolocation of equipment. As I said to you the other day, they got some high-res satellite imagery from here and found another 50... Russian destroyed piece of Russian equipment on top of the 96 they'd already mapped just because they had higher resolution imagery. Each resolu each high res imagery for an area that big costs about $400. If you can help Andrew Perpetua out with his mapping, when you go onto his Twitter hand, uh, onto his Twitter account or go to his YouTube channel, uh, that's I think re would be really helpful if anyone has the wherewithal the desire to do that. Um, that would be fantastic. But yeah, it has been very painful for the Russians to take this area. They've lost phenomenal amounts of kit. But again, it's back to what uh, Greg was saying. You know, they're prepared to do that. That it, that calculation is is a calculation they're fine with. We will take a few kilometers. We will lose a lot. But hey, we've got the stocks behind to, to keep doing that. When we come down to Bakhmut, there's no change to the mapping for the last 24 hours. That doesn't mean there isn't stuff happening. It just means that either there's a lag or, or a lull, just a temporary lull. But the Ukrainians are under immense pressure around Chesi VR. It's happening around uh, Ivanivska, possibly even going a little bit further south to Klyshchivka, and then further up north to the Bodonivka area as well. According to Surat Max, they had some, some success there, the Russians, uh, previously. No reports of pro-Ukrainian mapper or source says Russian forces have slightly advanced into the center of Ivanivska. So this is 
would be from yesterday and the day before, as geolocated image sh imagery shows. Fights here take place within 50 metres of each other. Russians are advancing along a small forest strip north of Klyshivka, taking over some positions. Uh, that's important because that's high ground north of uh, Ivanivska. And this is the key, like I keep saying, but just for um, the benefit of Greg's viewers that might not have seen my mapping, you've got Ivanivska here, which lies below, below the high ground just north of it. And control of this high ground basically will give you control of Ivaniska, really, because you can just, if you control this area, then you've got the full sight over Ivaniska and you, it just becomes a kill box, really. Uh, and so. Same thing we're yeah. talking about, for example, like in Robotny. The, the, yeah. you know, the, the, a lot of these um, places. So there's lots of ravines throughout this area. So um, let me tell you, that, for example, Chasiv Yar, right? So I'll translate that for you. Chasiv and Yar, two words. Yar means ravine. And you guys are going to be shocked what Chasiv means. But Chasiv means quiet. <laughs> so Chasiv Yar actually translates quiet ravine. Um, so it's <laughs> there's lots of Yars all throughout because the terrain is just just absolutely ravines the, the word is ravine not really hilly just ravines and they put a lot of these towns in the ravine yes uh for some reason my browsers are blocking me doing something there um i'm going to try and get you a topographical map of the area uh in a minute but i'll just finish doing the uh the frontline update first mm -hmm. so anyway uh, in the meantime, uh, it is. And difficult. I do, I do have an update coming on the giving um, in just a few minutes. You guys, hang on here before Johnny and I close out. Awesome. Uh, so, as Greg knows, it's very difficult in Bakhmut, and he's saying that the battalion commander around there, pretty much admitting that Chazivyar will eventually go, even Iska will go uh, at some point. It's just a matter of how how long and how much can they bleed the Russians uh, for 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 doing that. Um, there are defences built behind that, as Grace says. This area has been there's been military around Kramatorsk and uh, Sloviansk and Konstantinivka for so long because these have been the areas that have been supplying Bakhmut. So during the whole Bakhmut uh, debacle, it, these were the area, the staging points essentially, you know, in different ways. And so the Ukrainians might well be well prepared, but the problem is the closer you get to these cities, the more the cities get directly shelled from artillery rather than longer distance uh, rockets. And then the, the more you lose these places forevermore. You know, the more these places... I was just in a lot. Um, and I was, I it's, it's large. I was surprised at how much more damage is happening, yeah. um, especially on the eastern side. It's it's just... Well, yeah, so if you think from the center of um, Konstantinivka to there. Now, uh, there's, there's an argument that Russian artillery doesn't have the range it used to. Uh, so even 20 kilometers, which is a normal artillery range mm -hmm. easily, actually, they might struggle a little bit with that, depending on the, the wear on their barrels and whatnot. But you would imagine that, that yeah, Konstantinivka is well. Yeah, that eastern side's getting hit, I can tell yeah. you. Yeah. Uh, so that's good news that it's, there's no movement, but that mm -hmm. doesn't mean that there won't be tomorrow, et cetera, et cetera. Then we come to Avdivka. And uh, again, the movements are according to Suryat Map. So this is a pro-Russian mapper saying that there are some uh, moves to the west of Olivka. And there's a couple of things that worry me here if these are true. So up in Badici, uh, north of Badici, they, the according to this Russian mapper, the Russians control uh, part of the ravine, if you like, or the start of the river up here. And they control some area west of the river down here by Bedici. Now, that is super worrying because this area is, well, let's zoom in a little bit, This, this, there's a river here. Let's draw that on so you can more clearly see it. This river starts basically up here and comes along around there and goes to Umanska and off over to there. Now, the Ukrainians have basically put, have pulled themselves back behind the river, obviously, and it's high ground to the west of that river. And so this is a good, advantageous position for the Ukrainians, and they could, should be able to hold on to that for at least some time. Uh, now, if the Russians have actually got across the river here, then that's a problem. And 
m more concerning, this is where, well, just as concerning, and this has been my worry, is that they would just try and come down from the north um, by getting around the beginning of the river and coming up around the railway here and then coming down there. Uh, and and behind the Ukrainian lines because that's what they appear to be doing around here. The mm -hmm. Ukrainians had pushed them back south of Novokonyove, so the Ukrainians had actually, I think, recognised this challenge uh, and done some counterattacking here. But if if they have had success here, that is a problem for the Ukrainians. But again, that's the react max, and it could just be a repelled attack, and they usually just denote that as Russian gained, even if it's a blown up a couple of BMPs that haven't got anywhere. So take it with a pinch of salt for both of those claims. But it could be that the Russians have got across the river. I don't know. Time will tell. Yep, absolutely. And then as uh, as uh, Greg has said, no, you know, Krasnodarivka is super important. Kurokov mm -hmm. over here is super important. And the Ukrainians have managed to stop, or at least the Russians haven't advanced significantly there for some time now, actually. Best part of the week, really, around here. Where they are having more success appears to be around Nova Mikhailivka, which mm -hmm. is a challenge too. I mean, then they get to Kostantinivka, then they get control over this road that gives them the ability to come down to Vuhledar. But then if they cut all of this off, then the Ukrainians are unable to get high Mars down to uh, to Mariupol. So actually, this is quite important area here. And Nova Mikhailivka is the first domino, really, or the next domino along to this area being taken control of. So it's important that the Ukrainians keep hold of this as long as possible. But obviously, they don't want to keep hold of it so long that they attrit their own troops in a mm -hmm. calculation that's not beneficial. So all of that will be going on. But according, again, to Syriac Maps Pro Russian Mapper, the, the, the Russians have made some fairly significant gains along that axis there. So this is, um, no, that's uh, further up north. This is here. Syriac Map says uh, that the Russian troops control 55% of Nova, Nova Mikhailivka. Again, take that with a pinch of salt. Um, yeah, so... Uh, there is that. And then no reports talks about in the area that geolocated footage confirms further Russian progress south of Nova Mikhailivka into the urban area connecting with Russian troops advancing from the east. So that's actually different from what Suret Maps has said by saying this is control down here uh, or slightly different rather than control gained up here. But anyway, you know, <laughs> what's interesting to me, it's not urban. It's uh, it's very rural there, but it's three streets of houses. There's no. It's yeah, a, it's a small little place, but yes, important little place. But it's been important, yeah. So Very. this is an ag agricultural setup. Yeah, yeah, there. yeah. They're just, that's all that is. Chicken houses. Yeah, I, mean, I don't know. I'm guessing probably chicken farm. Yeah, mm -hmm. and north of there, equally, um, equally rural, but actually quite well fortified by the Ukrainians previously. But if they start losing north and south of there, then you start seeing it all get filled in. So the Ukrainians. Uh, struggling to maintain control over areas around here uh, and losing ground all, all around this area. Uh, but, yeah, we'll see how that develops and whether it, it, it's a an area where the... I mean, the Russians have lost phenomenal, and I mean phenomenal amounts of equipment around Nova Mikhailivka. They honestly have, like, the geolocated evidence of, of the numbers of bits of kit they've lost here is just stupendous. But they seem to just be fine with that. It's just incre incredible. Right. And then when we come to the southern front lines, there's a tiny bit. I think it's probably more of a rejig for Syriac maps around a place called Myrna, not the Myrna where Kirill lives, but another one. Uh, it's probably a rejig as opposed to Ukrainians counterattacking there. But they had had some gains there, the Russians. So it could just be an overzealous uh, bit of mapping originally by Syriac maps. And now that's been change although andrew perpetua still has that under russian control anyway really there's not too much to report even from robotinet seems to have been fairly quiet and i say quiet in scare quotes because it's not going to be quiet it's going to be hellish but there there's no change in the mapping and again nepro no changes there too uh even though the russians are still trying to dislodge the ukrainians from crinky there are still a few people left over there doing uh, doing an, an incredible job of mm -hmm. pretty much sacrificing themselves so that the Russians uh, a trip themselves on that in some kind of a military Harry Kiri. Anyway, uh, that's the that's the front lines. There are a few sources I forgot to tip into, but the last thing I would much. say, and I'm going to have to get going in a moment. Yeah. Um, the last thing I would say is uh, just do not forget Hedersan. It's it's horrible. Um, so I, I, I it, it's nonstop. 
I was just sleeping there. It's nonstop, guys. Nonstop shelling. It, it's it's being destroyed inch by inch. And um, basically, yeah, the city's yeah. laid siege to basically. Well, so I this is what I keep saying with reference to the fact that I've been to Kherson mm -hmm. and I didn't see a single military person in Kherson. I saw lots of them outside it and and, and block points and whatnot. And I'm okay. sure there are I'm sure there are military in Kherson, of course there are. But uh, but compared to other places, I seeing no military when every other person in every other place I saw was military was actually quite remarkable. And so my opinion of Kherson is that it's mainly uh, it's mainly civilians that, that are there tenuously hanging on to civilian life. And when the Russians hit it with shells and uh, rockets and whatever, it is more overtly terrorism than in any other place on the front line or near the front line. W would you agree with that? I believe that that is a city under siege. I yeah. believe that it's going to be leveled to the ground. Um, so since you've been there, Johnny, which is almost seven weeks ago, yeah, um, it's much, much worse. You would be surprised yeah. at seeing the amount of damage. And I can tell you as well, the amount of soldiers you saw in and around that area, as you were describing, is now exponentially less so yeah and, and and then so it's just fascinating because there's nothing to hold on to no i mean it's it, so it th my point was always that they if you were going to put military there you'd just be sitting targets there's no point being there and it doesn't offer you you know it's a city that's right on a front line like the river separates the the russian line from the ukrainian line mm -hmm. and and therefore you don't need to be there etc etc so therefore Every attack on Kherson, which is every day, all day, using all sorts of different munitions, non -stop. is on civilians, and therefore is every every shell landing there in my books is 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 pretty much a war crime, and is is terrorism. It's literally trying to evoke terror in civilian populations, and I feel very I um. If people want to see, I know the guys that are here watching on my channel now know. Um, or maybe you you guys are here and you didn't see it. But if you're here and you're from Johnny's on Johnny's channel right now, go over to my channel and go to the live video from a few days ago called Ukrainian Heroes Share Truth of the Frontline and scrub toward the end. And you guys will be able to witness seven or eight minutes inside Hedersong. Um, and it will give you the best view of, yeah, go there and I'll show it to you. That way they'll know which one to, to do it. Click that. And then click live. And right there. So me with the two tall guys, because I'm six foot four. They're about eight foot three. <laughs> um, Ukrainian heroes share the truth of the front line. If you scrub over, and Johnny, you can do it. Just scrub your thing over real quick. And it's basically all black and walking through Hederson. Um, It's unbelievable experience but it'll give folks the idea and Herson, as you know johnny sits on that bank that hill it just goes down to the river and it's just just easy pickings and it's very very dangerous it's unfortunate it's such a beautiful city and um it's just being leveled, guys. It's being leveled. Yeah, and when I was there, you know, the sound of the outgoing and incoming artillery, my room was shaking, my windows mm -hmm. were rattling on that second night particularly. Uh, it, and every every time it was being hit, I was just thinking, yeah, that's that's hitting civilians. You you get uh, like, yeah, not a fan of that at all. Um, but yeah, that, that's my opinion of the war. Uh, of, of Russia. I don't want to start ranting. This is something, so I'm going to say this for the benefit of your audience, Greg, mm -hmm. because I said it to mine a number of times. But Jamie Snow said, Jonathan, can you explain to everyone what about hitting the like button and clicking on the mainstream media, please? Now, this may sound weird to you, Greg, but this is actually something I was thinking of this last week, and I've been trying to get my uh, audience to do this, because we complain that mainstream media doesn't uh, I'm going to close the Mac down, uh, doesn't report on Ukraine enough, right? This is a common complaint that you and I have. The, the, we talked about this recently with regard to the strikes on on Khaviv when you were there, right? Mm -hmm. But actually, unless it's a public service broadcaster like the BBC or PBS or whatever, they are a, 
a, a news organization that is basically uh, an economic entity that is trying to make profits, right? And so they are feeding the audience what they want. And if the audience doesn't click on, is, isn't interested enough to click on Ukraine mm -hmm. news pieces, then they won't put those news pieces uh, at the top of their news agenda, right? Uh, and so actually they're reacting largely to their audience. So while we complain that they are not showing stuff, um, they are just actually giving the audience what they want. And if they don't Correct. read Ukraine, they won't give it. So I've been appealing to my audience to so even if you don't read it, you don't have to bother reading it. But if you're on your CNN app or your Fox News app or your BBC mm -hmm. app or your Guardian app or whatever, or on, on websites, click on the Ukraine stuff. Did you come off it or just click on it or leave it open in, in, a, in a browser or whatever? We need to artificially, like, I know it's you might not think that this is a nice thing to do, but we need to manipulate the algorithms to tell people that Ukraine is still important so that it then feeds back into the loop of getting the, that news on onto the news cycles. It might not help, there's only a few of us, but. But there is there is value on clicking on news pieces, even if you get your news from YouTube before you get it from mainstream media. Please click on mainstream media Ukraine news items. Thank you. And very well said. And I'm reading the chat. People are so kind um, saying, OK, let's help Greg get the message out more and more. So, guys, um, I, I'm pushing my 90th day and I've got to leave. And actually I, I had to step up a minute ago because I had to send a, a picture over to my lawyer here in Ukraine. I'm getting a different visa because now I'm going to just be coming and going. Um, yeah, I've, got, I've asked you, but I was going to ask you, gonna be so how are you going to get be able to come back? Uh, I, I'm going to have multi-entry visa. No problem. It's, it's already right. done. Yeah. And we're just going to take that out of the way. Um, but um, people are saying, okay, just, you know, Greg, find a way to, uh, get the message out to more people. I'm working on it. But when I'm on my off time of the front line, I'll still be streaming and updating and Jane, will be live reporting. Nothing changes. And um, we'll still be rolling with Johnny and Gertis and Mercado Media and all, all these places we're cooking with. So that will all keep rolling um, at, the, at, at even an, a higher level of the streamability because I'll be in my home studio that's tricked out. Um, so that'll be happening there. But then also want to try to find ways to get it more into mainstream media for all of us, because this is what we've got to get to um, uh, to, to to help this get better. Um, Absolutely. And, and, and in more people. So let's do this, Johnny. And I've got to get going. Yeah, um, I'm just going to say some thanks to people. Uh, yeah, please, your... let's do that. Thank you. So right, Robert, so Robert... Lockhart, who, who already thanked, thanked you, but then he said, uh, can't leave out JP. So he, he, so thanks, Robert. Really appreciate that. Uh, very kind. David, uh, Slava Ukraine. Uh, great work, guys. Thank you very much, David. Super kind of you. Uh, one for you, Greg Lynn. Thank Give you, Lynn. Some Canadian love there. And a nice Canadian avatar. That is a nice, I like that. that is awesome. I like that. That's great. Because that's a, not only is it a maple leaf, but it's got the trident inside it. I, I just love it. Uh, Graham Baker gifting five memberships. Thanks, Graham. Always uh, a great support there. And then saying, hope this little uh, helps a little. Thank you I incredibly much for that Australian support. Uh, super cool, Graham. Thank you. Stu Bedasso here says, just joined yesterday. Thank you, Stu, for, for indeed joining. And awesome. thank you for being part of the team because we are a team. Um, uh, that's cool. Adrian, uh, for this is for your with some uh, some Swiss. Adrian's a legend to push the algorithm. Thank you, Adrian. Yeah, good stuff. Thanks, matey. Uh, me and the pig with some Canadian support there. Thank you, me and the pig. Uh, me and the pig and the team. BTC Bandit, thank you very much uh, for, for your Euro support there. Really important. Um, certainly to me. Uh, Louise Foley, uh, thanks to you both, Jonathan and Greg. This one's for Jonathan. Also did a donation to Greg's PayPal Slover Ukraine. Thank you, Thank very, you very much. much. And we're going to get an update on that shortly, yeah, I presume. Uh, somebody put something in here. Uh, Holy Oblation, big shout out to Linda S. Yeah, she made a large donation for the... Yep, got it. Definitely. She's amazing. Para Andy, thank you so much. Uh, being there for the long haul, Para Andy. I remember you from my early days. So uh, thank you. And John Larkin, such an incredible support of the of the uh, channel as well. Thanks, John. Really good, good of you. Um, Johnny Christensen, uh, thanks for the super sticker. And Tanya Rindenko with some Canadian love. Every little helps. It does indeed. 
and then for Greg, uh, th so thank you, Tanya, and you support Greg's channel as well. So thank you mm -hmm. so much for that. And know that you know they exist. Says uh, for Greg, more chocolate <laughs> for giants. <laughs> Metaphor until I win the lotto. Chocolates being delivered nonstop. Thank you, thank you. Is that the candy? Yeah, candies. Candies for yeah the uh, candy yeah. yeah. Uh, say no more right uh karen furry uh so so incredible canadian support there so thank you karen uh really insanely kind uh and i'll leave that up as we we end uh so thank you karen and usa 54 thank you uh for you earlier on as well so holy ablation uh usa sorry that's si usa 54 uh holy ablation uh for a super sticker big shout out to linda uh, S for for her huge donation uh, and the final one. Sorry, Greg, for taking so long. No here. problem. Uh, Stupidity in essence uh, with some Danish love is my, of course, my favourite uh, Nordic band. Uh, you are awesome, guys. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, it's very kind of you, Stupidity. Although it seems odd calling you Stupidity, um, but you get what I'm saying. So, what's the latest update, Greg? So we started at what 196. 196.5? What were we at? Yeah. Yep. 196, that's, that's 196.5. That's 196.5. Okay, 196.5. And um, over one hour and 42 minutes, can we get a drum roll from Johnny Pierce? 202476 dollars We've raised about 6000 during the chat. And the 200 is smashed. We're well on our way to 260. Thank you, everybody. I just got a shiver down my spine. And what was amazing is we didn't even <laughs> we didn't even mean it. Like we, we weren't like this wasn't a fundraising chat. We we're just like, no. let's have a chat, see how you're getting on, do some. But but I, I need to say this because I have to go to a meeting. I have to say this. This is the goodness of the people. We didn't come on here with any intention to do that. I was just happy to sit down and go, hey guys, we hit 196.5. But it's the people saying, OK, challenge accepted. Let's get to 200 today. And then people start responding. So thank you. And guys, I, I promise you, as you've seen in all the other videos we do, you will see every step of the way. And for this project going all the way to the front lines with these now four armored vehicles we're pushing for, you're going to be a part of it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Just amazing. Absolutely amazing um really really it is indeed awesome uh so well look thank you people not greg i'm going to thank him in a second but thank you for all you've mm -hmm. done and for for watching this and supporting uh the the efforts of greg uh and genya and the amazing work that they do on on the front line delivering that stuff and for getting helping to get three medevacs so far and we'll be working continually to get that fourth one uh, but thank you, Dickie, Greg, for all you did. Dickie Dawson, Dickie Dawson's in the uh, chat of the Shills, and he's a massive supporter of Ukraine as well. So thank you, the Dick Dawson and the Shills. Is that Doctor Dawson there? That's Doc, that's Doc Dawson. Yes. Um. So he's from the Shills. Yes, I'm going to get you on there. Yeah, because uh, do you know what? About a year ago, uh, someone, I think it might have been King Raccoon, someone, anybody uh -huh. was like, like, I need to get you on the shields. And I was like, yeah, let's do it. But I've been, I just, it, it's. So would you, by, by the way, of course, of course I would. Uh, let's okay, do so a, let's no do a coast, this one. Yeah, we'll do a co stream or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. I don't want to invite myself on the shields, but someone was asking, saying that they were. I just invited them. my co host. All right. I got elevated, you know, because I have to put cotton in. He likes to use a lot of colorful language. So I have to put cotton in my ears and let it filter through so that I'm not warped too much. But you no, are, you are, you are a delicate soul. Uh, <laughs> we need to look after you, Greg. Uh, it's not, not from the bombs and, and, no. and the missiles that flying past your ears. It's just that, that cussing that's taking place. We can't have it's it. okay. Everything's good. All right, um, guys. Okay, well, look, uh, take care, y'all. Uh, really appreciate you. Thank you take so much. Take care, y'all. Stupidasso90 coming in. Had to round it up. We are now a done deal. Okay. Thank you, Stu. Two, That's 2025, guys. Let's go. We got it. Thank you. Thank wow. you. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you. And thank you to Karen. Thank you to Stu. Thank you to SR uh, and to all the very kind people. Thank you to Greg. Take care, everybody. And uh, we'll speak to you very soon. Good night.